Hello, and welcome to a digital mathematics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be talking about Module 9 in Math 1030, the section that has to deal with probability. Now, I'll say at the beginning here that we're not going to go too deep into probability. We're going to keep it relatively basic, and I say relatively. However, know that of the sections that involve uh, what is typically Exam 3, so Modules 7 through 10, uh, I typically say that Module 9 is one of the more difficult ones, simply because there's a lot going on here. Um, particularly because there's going to be a lot of different formulas that we'll discuss here. And a lot of the tricks here is going to be trying to notice what do we need to use at any given point. The overall concept of it is not too hard. Uh, however, applying the right formulas and applying the right concepts can be a little bit tricky. So just know that moving forward. Okay, I'm going to be splitting this into three different sections and therefore also three different videos. The first section we're going to be talking about here is the basics of probability. And then in videos two and three, we're going to be talking about conditional probability and expected value. First, the basics of probability. And I expect this to be the longest because there's a lot to introduce here. Uh, for the basics of probability, we have a few definitions that we need to talk about. First, the definition for probability itself. The definition for probability is the measure or likelihood that a random behavior occurs. So how likely it is that something were to actually happen. Likelihood. There we go. So that's what probability means in a nutshell. How likely something is to actually happen. That's probably what you know probability as at the moment, like the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow. How likely is it that it is going to rain tomorrow? Or uh, the probability that I will win this amount of money in a gambling game. That's the likelihood that I'm going to win given all this random behavior that's occurring around it. Now, in order to find probability, what we're going to do is talk about a few other terms here. First, what we refer to as an outcome. An outcome is what we call the individual results from a probability experiment. The individual results from a probability experiment. Now, what that means is the, the little things that can happen, each different option that can occur. For example, if you're rolling dice, uh, on one six-sided die, the outcomes that are possible are one, two, three, four, five, and six. If I'm drawing cards, the outcomes that are possible are things like the two of hearts, the three of hearts, the four of hearts, etc., etc. Each individual result that can happen, we will refer to as an outcome. Now, finding the probability of just a singular outcome is never really interesting because it's always one out of something. For example, on a six-sided die, the probability to find uh, uh, the probability of getting a three is one out of six. The probability of getting a two is one out of six because there's one way of happening out of the six different possibilities. Those aren't really too interesting. What we instead are going to talk about or more concern ourselves with is what we call an event. Now, an event or what we we usually were use the uh, we usually use a capital E for this as well. Uh, an event is just any collection of some outcomes. Is any collection of some outcomes. And we usually use just a capital E to represent this. So if you see anything like E or capital F or capital C, it's usually an event that we refer to by a capital letter. Typically, we do this because events tend to be more complicated than just a one-word thing. For example, the probability of getting an even number on a six-sided die. That takes a lot to say and a lot to write down. So we may instead uh, simplify that with a capital E to represent even. That's a lot easier to use in mathematical notation. Now... Now that we know an event, what we also want to talk about is a sample space. A sample space, which we also use a capital letter to refer to, but we typically use the capital letter S. The sample space is the collection of all outcomes. So the collection of all possible outcomes in a probability experiment. That's 
That's what we refer to as a sample space. So the reason we talk about a sample space, it may seem relatively basic, particularly if you're dealing with something like just a six-sided die. The sample space would be just the listing of the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. And there are some explicit ways of doing that, but we just need it relatively basic. Just the list is fine. Um, but the reason that we talk about a sample space is because sometimes a sample space isn't that easy. And it's going to be very important to try to figure out how big the sample space is in order to determine the probability. All right, so those are some definitions that we have for probability. Now what we're going to talk about is the actual formula, which I've already kind of alluded to uh, at least a little bit. Uh, it may be relatively straightforward to some, but we still want to talk about explicitly what it means and how we write it, uh, particularly the notation that we'll use. For probability, the formula that we'll have for probability, we tend to write probability as P parentheses E, or P parentheses F, or P parentheses D, whatever. What this is read as is the probability of the event E, or if I had probability of F, I'd write it like that. This does not mean in mathematics notation, this is not the same as P times F. That's not what this means. This is specific notation. Kind of like how we use a square root, this symbol to refer to find the number that multiplies itself to make the number on the inside. When we write P parentheses, this is saying the probability of whatever's on the inside. Now, to find the probability, we're going to make a fraction of two values. Let me write a better line. There we go. Fraction of two values. On top, we're going to have the number of outcomes for E. So on top, we have the outcomes in the event E. And on the bottom, we'll represent the sample space. So the outcomes in E over the total sample space. That is what we want here. Okay. Now, there's a little bit of an easier way of writing that. We can simply just say N parentheses E and N parentheses S. What this refers to is the number of values in E, or your event, and this refers to the number of values in S, or your sample space. Now, what that really means, though, is that to find the probability, it's just one number over another. How many ways something can happen over the total amount of possibilities? And that's how we're going to find probability moving forward. Now, because it's a fraction like this and the bottom is the sample space, which is the overall total, that bottom should always be the largest value. And what that also means is that probability is going to be relatively restricted. All probability, all probability is going to be between zero and one. So the probability of any event will always be between zero and one. We're going to never, we're never going to have a negative probability. And we're never going to have a probability of over one or a hundred percent. So there's no such thing as 120% or 110% in our cases. It's just a percentage amount or a decimal amount between zero and one. If it has a probability of zero, we call that impossible. And if it has a probability of one, we call that certain. So impossible means it's never going to happen. Certain means it always happens. In realistic circumstances with probability, we there is a distinction between what is physically done and what is kind of mentally done. Um, and that's uh, that's what we call the difference between empirical probability and uh, theoretical probability or classical. Um, if you're doing empirical probability, what that means is that you're actually physically testing something. 
for example, you're trying to you're looking at a big batch of apples and saying how many of them have a virus inside of them or how many of them have a have a worm inside of them, something like that. Um, that would be empirical probability because you're collecting a huge bunch of apples and saying how many of them have that quality or how many of them have that uh, that quality in mind. If you're doing something classically or theoretically, then that means that you're trying to think about realistically what should happen in the long run. Uh, maybe if I'm rolling dice, I should theoretically know that uh, on a six-sided die, the probability of rolling a five on a six-sided die should theoretically be one out of six. It's one out of six because there's one five on a six-sided die, and there's six options. The number is one through six. So this is the number five, and these, this is the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. That would be the probability of rolling a five on a six-sided die. However, that's theoretical. I'm not necessarily going to have that happen in a limited amount of cases. For example, if I roll a, a die six times, I am not guaranteed that one of them will be a five, one of them will be a four. It's very possible that none of them are fives. It's, very, it's also possible that all of them are fives. This is going to be the theoretical probability if we were to do something an infinite amount of times. And this kind of branches into something we call the law of large numbers. Now this isn't the most important thing, at least uh, for our class, but it's really important to understand how probability works. Um, so I like to talk about it. It's really the concept that as you increase the number of trials of an experiment, you should get closer and closer to the theoretical probability. So if I were to roll a six-sided die 12 times, I'm not guaranteed that one-sixth of those are gonna be fives. But maybe if I roll it 1,200 times, or 12,000 times, or 12 million times, I should get closer and closer to one-sixth of those being the number five. That's what the law of large numbers states, and it's something to keep in mind that you don't have the misconception that theoretical and empirical probability are the same. A lot of people will sometimes make a mistake saying that, oh, I rolled a one a bunch of times on a six-sided die. That means I should get other numbers now because the universe has to balance out eventually, right? And though that is theoretically true, in the short-term sense, it's still possible that I can still get a bunch of ones in a row. Um, and that has happened a lot of times. Uh, there's even a case in Monte Carlo that brought up what we call the Monte Carlo fallacy that has to deal with this. So it's something to always keep in mind and you'll very often hear the concept of the law of large numbers in uh, news outlets when talking about probability of things. Um, particularly if they're going through an experiment that was done and making sure that we are aware that with larger sample sizes, we should get closer to the theoretical probability of something. So it's just a concept to keep in mind. Now, as for a couple examples here, uh, let's do just a few quick examples. I already did one for rolling a six-sided die. How about if you roll two dice and the probability that you get a sum of eight? So I'll say probability of a sum of eight on a pair of dice. Well, in order to find that, that's a little bit more complex. When I add two values on dice, I could get a minimum of 1 plus 1 equals 2 up to a maximum of 6 plus 6 equals 12. So I could get any value between 2 and 12. However, getting an 8 isn't just one of those possibilities. There's a lot of different ways of getting an 8. For example, I could have... 2 plus 6, that equals 8. I could also have 3 plus 5, and I could also have 4 plus 4. Those are all ways of getting a sum of 8 on a pair of dice. However, the likelihood isn't just going to be 3. There's not just three ways of doing it, there's actually a couple more. And that's because this is considering a certain order. 
two on the first die, six on the second die could also be replicated as six on the first die and two on the second die. Likewise, 3 plus 5 could also be represented as 5 plus 3. Notice that these are all different outcomes that lead to the same event of a sum of 8. 2 on the first, 6 on the second is different. Um, so 2 on the first, 6 on the second is different than 6 on the first and 2 on the second. 3 on the first and 5 on the second is different than 5 on the first and 3 on the second. These are different outcomes, but they lead to the same result. Overall, though, that means that we have a total probability of five different outcomes. However, the denominator, the sample space, is still unknown. Notice that it's not just going to be 2 through 12, so 10 different ways, because we've just indicated that there's five different ways of getting an 8. What we're going to use is what we call the counting rule that can be very useful in cases like this to find how many ways something can happen. And the counting rule is very, very easy. The counting rule simply states, take all your objects and find how many ways each of those objects can happen. So here I have two dice. So let's see if I can replicate dice here. So I have one die and I have a second die. Well, this first die can have six different possibilities and the second die could also have six different possibilities. The counting rule states that, well, Find how many ways each object can happen, and then multiply those together. 6 by 6 gives me 36 different outcomes. You could list all these out if you wanted to, like 1 plus 2, 2 plus 1, 1 plus 2, 3 plus 1, 1 plus 3, 2 plus 2. You can list all these outcomes, and there's a lot of them, but this counting rule can really help with that. So, we have a total amount of 36 ways that this can happen. So that would be the sum of 8 on two dice. You'll note that finding the sample space is going to be very important. Here's another example of that. Say you have three children, and you want to find the probability that exactly two are girls. And I'll say exactly two. So we don't want two or three, something like that. So we want to find the probability that we have two girls out of the three children. Well, to do that, what we want to do is consider what the sample space is. Because there's a lot of mistakes that some people would make with this. Uh, some people would think, okay, well, you could have zero girls, one girl, two girls, or three girls out of the three children. So the probability should be 1 out of 4. However, that is incorrect. What we really need to do is build what the different outcomes are. So first, for uh, the three children, what I could have are all boys. So I'll represent that as boy, boy, boy. I could also have all girls. These are two different outcomes that are possible for the three children. Now again, right now, we're only also just considering binary, so just boys or girls. What I could also have is one girl represented as girl, boy, boy. However, one girl can also be represented as boy, girl, boy. This is a different family composition. And those that have had maybe an eldest sister and two younger brothers, or a middle sister and an older and younger brother, know that these are completely different family structures. However, these different outcomes are all under the same purview of one girl. Even though this doesn't necessarily uh, need to matter for exactly the, how many ways two girls can happen, we do need this for a sample space. So we do need to consider all ways I could have all these different possibilities. And having one girl can happen in three, these three different ways. Either the eldest is a girl, the middle, or the youngest. Likewise, if I have two girls, I could have the two eldest being girls and the youngest being a boy. I could have the eldest being a boy and the two youngest being girls. Or I could have the middle child being a boy. These are all the different possibilities. 
I have all the different ways for one girl, for two girls, for all girls, and for no girls. And what we find is that my sample space is eight. There's a size of eight here. Of those, the amount that have two girls are these three. So we have a probability of three out of eight. That would be the probability of having two girls in a family. Now with each of these, you can keep them as fractions or you can reduce them to decimals if you simply want to divide them. Uh, for example, three out of eight should give you 0.375. However, it just depends on the question. Note that in all these cases, though, it was really important for us to consider the sample space. Sometimes the sample space is given, and if it is, that's great. We can just work with it. If not, we do need to consider what the sample space is. A couple that you will see very often, uh, particularly for dice, um, you will very often see questions that say, what happens if you have a sum of two dice? Um, and there will always be 36 different outcomes. We've established that here, so the more you see those, the, uh, the more you'll start to remember that number. All right, so those are some examples of finding some probabilities. The first one being relatively basic of just one out of six for how many fives out of the total. And then the other two being a little bit more complex, maybe a little bit more going on. Now, in probability, there are three specific formulas that we're also going to use. And this is more the case when we're combining multiple different events together, not just considering um, one thing happening, like me just rolling one die. Um, if I'm combining some events, like kind of what we did up here with two different dice in a row, or, or out of three children, how many, uh, what's probability of two of them being girls, we have some probabilities and formulas that can help us with that. Now I'm going to write each of these down first, and then we're going to talk about what they mean. First, the addition rule. The addition rule for probability is the probability of E and F. Oh, sorry, not E and F, E or F. Probability of E or F. And the probability of E or F states the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. What that uh, refers to is what happens when we put two probabilities together. Uh, for example, uh, say I'm doing something like the probability of getting a two or a three on a six-sided die. Well, that that specific word of or, which is going to be very important for us, so make sure you keep that in mind, the word or. Um, if I say the probability of getting a two or a three, well, that's the probability of getting a two plus the probability of getting a three minus the probability of getting both of those at the same time. On a six-sided die, there's one, two out of six, and then there's also one, three out of six, and there are no numbers that are both a 2 and also a 3 at the same time. So we get a probability of 2 out of 6. That's what the addition rule states. So if you're combining events in that way, and again you're looking for that specific word of or, if you're combining events with the specific word or, then that means that you're simply adding them together, and then you take out the middle. You take out whatever's supposed to be on the inside there. Now, that middle part, the reason that that is brought up can be easily described by talking about a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram, you've likely seen before, is just two circles like this, where one of these refers to one event, so maybe this is event E, and this one is event F. So this circle represents how many ways E can happen, and F, this circle represents how many F can happen. Well, if I add both of these together, if I take the probability of E, so I'll shade this. If I add the probability of E with the probability of F, what happens is this middle region here got counted twice. All the outcomes that are in this middle region got counted once for E and got also counted once for F. 
So what we need to do, whoop, what we need to do is take out all instances that they were double counted and only count them one time. That's what this subtraction does here. The subtraction takes out the inside of this uh, Venn diagram. So this probability of E and F, this is where they both happen, that's the middle there. So that's why that subtraction exists. You'll see some instances where this happens, where uh, some events don't have any things in common, kind of like with dice, uh, or sometimes you'll have where events do have things in common. If they do, then you need to make sure you take out those common outcomes because otherwise they would have been counted twice. If they don't have any outcomes in common, like when rolling two dice in a row, um, they don't have any outcomes in common. You can't get like a two and a, or you're rolling one die and getting an outcome. There's no way of getting a one and also a six at the same time. That's not possible. So that's the addition rule. We'll have a couple examples of these moving forward. The multiplication rule is a little bit different. The multiplication rule will talk about this E and F uh, concept. So the probability of E and F. Know that this is a different modifier. Finding the probability of E and F is going to be a different function entirely. If you see the word and, then what that means is that you're going to take the first one, probability of E, and what you're going to do is multiply that by the probability of the second one, hence multiplication rule. However, there's one more thing we're going to do here. Kind of like how before there was a little bit of a caveat we had to add here. There's one more thing we need to add to this probability, and that's instead of just having the probability of F, we say the probability of F given E. This vertical line does not mean division. This means the word given. You can also think about that as the word assuming that, or uh, it is the case that, something like that. Um, something that says the probability of, of F assuming that, so the probability of F assuming that E already happened. This is usually important for successive probabilities. It may not be tr true for some though. Uh, for exa uh, example, we could have found the probability of getting a sum of 8 in this way. Um, or maybe, uh, let's say the probability of, not really a sum of 8, let's say the probability of getting two sixes in a row. Getting two sixes in a row on a six-sided die, that's and. And the reason that is and is because in a row really means you got a six on the first die, and then you got a six on the second die. Notice that I linked those two statements with the word and. So if you can reword that with the word and, that's very important. So whenever you have successive events, or if you see the word both, that's a big signifier as well. So uh, the word both is very important. So both is important and in a row. All of these are instances of the multiplication rule. These are all things you're looking for. And to find that, like say if I have probability of getting two sixes in a row, or maybe in uh, in gambling, snake eyes is a more uh, important one. Snake eyes is getting two ones in a row. Well, getting the first one on the six-sided die is one out of six. Getting the second one on a six-sided die, assuming the first one happened, well, I don't care that the first one happened. The first die does not influence how the second die changes. So the, the first die does not change the probability of the second one. So it's still one out of six. And we would get one out of 36 if I multiply those two together. That's an example of doing the multiplication rule. Now, if the probability does change for one reason or another, then that means we have a different probability to consider. And we're going to have some instances in just a bit where this condition will be very important. Lastly, our last form that we're going to talk about today in this video is going to be the complement. And the complement 
which the complement is typically represented with a vertical line over E, or sometimes it is also represented as, as a like exponent of C, not really an exponent, but really a superscript of C. These are a couple different ways of representing the complement. And to find the complement, or what is referred to as the complement, what we're going to do is one minus the probability of E. What we refer to as probability of E, we refer we say probability of E complements, these are complementary complementary to each other. And the reason is if I were to add them together, if I were to do something like probability of E, so maybe this is the probability that it rains plus the probability of E complement should equal one. That's why they were represented as complementary. Now what the complement means, if the probability of E is the probability that it rains, the probability of the complement is that it doesn't rain. So it's the exact opposite. So complement or opposite, another way to think about it. And that's how all complements will work. If I have probability of E is rolling a six, probability of E complement is not rolling a six. So the word not, is a very big signifier of compliments. You can always usually read compliment, uh, compliments with the word not. Now, compliments are really going to be used in certain cases where it's far more convenient to use. So sometimes the compliment is a lot easier to consider in some probability cases. And again, we'll have a couple instances of that. All right, but these are our three formulas, and we're going to be using these moving forward. When they come up, I'll make sure to write them down again. Okay. Now, we have a couple examples here that we're going to try. Again, if you would like to pause your video and try them on your own first, go ahead and do that. For the first one, we have, at some random moment, you look at your cl clock and note the minutes remaining. What is the probability of the minutes reading is 15? Okay, well, looking at a clock, so I have a clock here. Um, the minutes reading, I have a minute hand that goes all the way around, and how many minutes are in an hour? Well, 60 minutes. So there's 60 different possibilities then. The minute hand could be on the 0, zero position, it could be on zero, 01 minute, it could be on zero, 02 minutes, on zero, 03 minutes, on zero, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, etc., etc could be on any of those different 60 positions. Now, the probability that the minutes reading is 15, and I'll write that down as P parentheses 15, is just how many ways it could be on the 15 position, and how many ways, uh, or how many ways it could be on the 15 position out of the total possibilities. Well, the 15 position is right here, and there's only one outcome that refers to the 15 minute position out of the total of 60 outcomes. All right, so that's the first one. Just a quick exa uh, example of just simple probability. B is gonna mix it up a little bit because it's gonna ask for a little bit more. It asks, what is the probability that the minutes reading is 15 or less? Okay, well, 15 or less, that means that we need to consider a bunch of different values then. Um, 15, notice the word or here. That's going to be very important. That means that we're going to add based on my probabilities. That means I'm going to do the probability of 15 plus anything that's less than that. Well, we have 15, 14, 13, 12, all these numbers are less than 15, two, one, and most would consider zero minutes. So these are all different possibilities that I could have. Therefore, we would say the probability of 15 or less would be these outcomes out of 60. So how many outcomes out of 60? Well, if I add all these together, 15 down to zero included, that actually is 
16 outcomes. If you include zero, which I typically would. It's either you consider the minute hand being on, so zero would be the minute hand being on noon position. If you consider that as zero or you consider that as uh, 60. If you consider at zero, which most people would, because most people would read something as um, two o'clock, not one o'clock and 60 minutes, um, or one hour and 60 minutes. Since most people would consider that as zero, we would consider that as less than 15 minutes. So I'd put all these together and there's 16 of those outcomes. So that's 16 out of 60. Now, if that's a little bit hard to wrap your head around of like why 15 to 0 is 16, why it's not 15, try counting out on your fingers right now, 0 through 15, and see how far you get. You should go through five hands worth, and then you should be one more finger. So it should be 16 different outcomes. Now, when representing these, notice that the problem doesn't specify whether we want the probability as fractions or whether we want them as decimals. That means we can keep them as whatever we want to at the moment. I can keep it as 1 out of 60, or I can represent it if I wanted to as 0 0.017 approximately. So I will then say, get rid of those that equal sign and say approximately 0 0.017. Or that could also approximately be 1.7%. It's another way I could represent that. Likewise, with 16 out of 60, I could represent that as a decimal. So 16 divided by 60 should give me about um, 0.267, which is also the same as 26.7%. Any of these would be okay to represent the probability, unless it explicitly states how the probability should be stated. If it wants as a decimal, make sure you give it as a decimal. If it wants as a percentage, give it as a percentage. Or, or if it's a fraction, keep it as a fraction. What I will say is do not simplify this fraction though, unless otherwise stated. If you are told to simplify the fraction, then go ahead. If not, there's no reason to do so. And there's a lot of mistakes that can be made with uh, fraction simplification. So I recommend not even doing it. Um, I've had instances where I've, I've had high-level mathematics students, so students in my calculus classes, make simple mistakes with fraction simplification. I've had some uh, of my students say 4 out of 10 is 1 fourth, and then they move on without even noticing that that is not true. It should be 2 fifths, so this is not the case. So what I'm saying here is do not simplify fractions unless you really need to, because otherwise you'll run into errors. Also, because if I'm comparing values or probabilities together, like my original probability of 1 out of 60 to my probability of 16 out of 60, it's a lot easier to compare those to say, all right, well, this one is 16 times larger than the other one. If I were to simplify this down, which goes to 4 out of 15, if I try to compare 1 out of 60 to 4 out of 15, that's a lot harder to do mentally. So it's not really in your best interest to even simplify just for comparison purposes. So I recommend don't do it unless you need to. All right, so another example. This one says, a card is pulled from a deck of cards and noted. The card is then replaced, the deck is shuffled, and a second card is removed and noted. What is the probability that both cards are aces? Okay, so now uh, what I have here is a little bit of a printout just to show a deck of cards. If you're not familiar with a deck of cards, you can use this to help uh, with this question. Uh, in a deck of cards, there's four of each number and set. So say uh, there's four aces, there's four twos, there's four threes, etc., all the way up to king. So that means there's 13 different possibilities. There's ace through king, that's 13 different cards. And there's four different sets. So ace, 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 there's four aces, there's four twos, there's four threes. And these sets are club, spade, heart, and diamond. Those are the four sets here. Okay, if you're familiar with the deck of cards, this may be a little bit easier. 
In this case, we can use this to help us with this question. It says a card is pulled from a deck of cards and noted. The card is then replaced. That's going to be very important for us. So the card is put back where it was. The deck is shuffled and a car second card is removed and noted. What is the probability that both cards are aces? Both is an important keyword. This is going to refer to and probability. This is going to refer to multiplication. When I say that both cards need to have this quality, so both are aces, what that really means, if I write this down as probability of both aces, what this really means is the probability that the first one is an ace, so I'll say a sub 1, and the second one is an ace. That's what both aces really means. It means the first is an ace and the second is an ace. So that means we're going to be doing multiplication here. Now to find this multiplication, we have the formula probability of the first one, a sub 1, times the probability of the second one, given the first one happened. That's our formula for and probability. The first probability should be relatively simple. The probability that you draw an ace. Well, of my cards here, there are four different aces. So four aces out of the total amount of cards, which there are 52 total cards. So that's four out of 52. Then I'm going to multiply that with the probability of getting the second ace given the first occurred. Now, what that means is that I already drew one ace. What's the probability that I got another one? However, the problem was very specific by saying that the card was replaced. What that means is that when I took my 52 card set, I drew one and one was an ace. I put that ace back in the deck. And that means that there are still... 52 cards in that deck, and likewise, there are still four aces in that deck. Meaning that this probability, the probability of getting the first ace, was irrelevant to the probability of me getting the second ace. I can multiply these together by multiplying straight across. 4 times 4 is 16, and 52 times 52 is 2704. So 16 out of 2704. That would be the probability that both are aces. Now, what if that replaced word was not there? If the card was not replaced, maybe I drew an ace and I set it aside, and then I drew another one. What that means is that, well, there's no longer four aces in that deck anymore. There's not four aces anymore. There's only three because I took one of those aces and I set it aside. Furthermore, if I set that card aside, that means there's one less total cards in the deck. So there's only 51 left over. That would give me a different probability. That would give me 12 out of 2,652. So that changed the probability because the previous event occurred. That is what you need to pay attention to and be careful of with conditional probability. If the first event alters your second event, then that means the probability gets changed as well. Okay, so I just wanted to go through that as an example of what would happen if it did not say replace. In this case it does though, so just 4 at 52 times 4 at 52. If you were to do this a lot of times, you could also note a pattern here, uh, particularly if they, they replace it every time. Doing this number times itself, 4 at 52 times itself, you could also represent this as 4 out of 52 quantity squared meaning that I did this twice. That can help, particularly if I took this further and said I drew eight cards and all of them were aces. Well, if I drew eight cards, 
then all I would have to change is this exponent. I'd be doing this 4 out of 52 times itself 8 times. So that can help. Alright, so that's an example of working with deck of cards and how and probability works. I have a couple more examples I want to do here. One more try now and then another probability I came up with and then we're done with this video. In your drawer, you have 10 pairs of socks, 6 of which are white. 7 t-shirts, 3 of which are white. If you reach in and grab, uh, randomly grab a pair of socks and a t-shirt, what's the probability that at least one is white? Okay, so at least one is going to be our important phrase here. When I look at the, the phrase at least one, what that means is that either one of those is white, so maybe, uh, let's say, a white sock. So maybe I have just a white sock, or white socks, and I have some other t-shirt, or maybe I have a white t-shirt. and some other uh, color pair of socks, or that both of them are white. That's what at least one means in this case. Think about it as well if like, um, if uh, you invited 10 people to a party and at least one of them brought you a present. Well, what that means is that the First, maybe Albert brought you a present and the others did not. It could also mean that Meredith brought you a present and the others did not. It could also mean that Betty brought you a present and the others did not. Those are all instances of at least one of them. Or maybe Albert and Betty brought you a present, but the others did not. Or maybe Albert, Betty, and Meredith all brought you a president, present and others did not. Those are all instances of at least one of them. What that means then is that the only way this cannot happen, so this is the way, this is for at least one. And this is not at least one. The only way that that can't happen is if neither are white. I bring this up because these are all probabilities that we can find. We can find the probability of just having white socks and uh, an off-color shirt. Or maybe the probability of having a white t-shirt and off-color socks. Or maybe the probability that both of them are white. Instead, what I could do is simply find one probability. Find the probability that neither of them are white. That, just looking at the work here, that would take a lot less time because that's only one probability we would need to find instead of one, two, three probabilities. You can also see how that would extrapolate further to my example with your party of 10 people. Um, find the probability that at least one of them brought you a present. Well, I could find the probability that the first person did, the others did not, second person did, the others did not, third person did, the others did not. Those are all different probabilities. Or the probability that two of them did, the others did not. The probability that three of them did, the others did not. Those are all different probabilities. That's a lot of things to consider. Or, I could simply look at the probability of none of them. That's going to be our main trick for at least one. And that's going to be our application of a complement. To find the probability of at least one, this is not really a defined formula, but this is a nice really thing to know. To find the probability of at least one thing happening, it's one minus the probability of none of them happening which is what I'm doing here. If I need to find the probability of at least one, I can instead find the probability that neither of them are white, take that away from one, and I am done. So let's do that. Um, probability that neither of them are white. So neither are white. Well, what that means is the probability that the first one is white. So the white socks, I'll say. Or, uh, not whites, sorry. Um, so I'll say white uh, socks colored. 
So probably the socks are not white. And the probability that the t-shirt is not white. That's what it means that neither of them are white. So the, the socks are not white, the t-shirt's not white. We combine those with the word and, which means we're going to multiply. So we want the probability the socks are not white times the probability that the t-shirt is not white given the socks are not. I'm using NW for not white. Well, of the socks we have in the original description, there are 10 pairs of socks. Six of them are white. So that means of those that are not white, four of them are not white. So four out of 10. That's also using a complement. If six are white, that means four are not. Then the probability of finding a t-shirt, well, there's seven t-shirts, three are white. So that also means that four t-shirts are not white out of the seven. This conditional probability here, that didn't matter. There's no instance here that uh, choosing a non-white sock influenced how you chose your shirt. So this condition here wasn't really relevant. And what we get here is 16 out of 70. Four times four is 16, 10 times seven is 70. So that's the probability of neither of them being white. So let's write that, write that over here again. Probability that neither are white. We found that probability to be 16 out of 70. But that wasn't the question. We wanted the probability of at least one being white. Well, in order to find that, as we have listed up here, we need to do 1 minus the probability of none of them being white, which is what we just found, so 1 minus 16 out of 70. To do the subtraction, 1 can be represented as 70 out of 70. That's one of the most useful things about the number 1. It is very malleable. We can make it any fraction. So we can make it any number over itself. And in order to subtract these, we just subtract straight through. So 70 minus 16, and we keep the denominator of 70. Uh, 70 minus 16 gives me 54 out of a total of 70. So that would be my probability here of at least one of them being white. You can also represent that as a decimal if you want to. 54 out of 70 is about 77% or 77.14. So it's about 0.7714 if you want to consider what the probability or decimal would be. All right, so that's an example of using at least one and applying complements. Now, again, you could have done this in a straightforward way if you wanted to. Find the probability of having white socks and then no white, no color or a colored shirt. Probability of a white shirt and a colored socks. And then probability of both of them being white and add all those together. That would give you this same probability here, 54 out of 70. However, this tends to take a little bit less time because this way you're only considering one probability and taking that away. All right. Lastly, you buy a CD online. This is an example I have uh, added here, so this didn't come from the textbook. You buy a CD online and listen to it. You find that of the 12 songs, you like five of them. You then play the CD again, enabling the shuffle mode on your player so that the songs are played in a random order. Find the probability that of the first two songs played, you like both of them or you like at least one of them. Okay, so a couple things of note here. Let's uh, highlight them. Uh, we have here 12 songs, and you like five of them. We want to find the probability that of the first two songs played, what's the probability you like both, and you like at least one. Furthermore, we're shuffling the songs, so the songs are played in a random order. What that also means is that when one song is played, it is no longer put back in the CD. 
that's going to be very important for us. All right, so for A, the probability that you like both of them. So probability that you like both. That should be a very important keyword you see from now, uh, now the word both. That's going to mean that we're looking for the probability that, I'll say L for like, like the first song and you like the second song. So that's what both means. In order to find that, what we do is find the probability that you like the first song, and we're going to multiply that by the probability that you like the second song, given you like the first one. And this is going to be an instance where the given is going to be very important for us. All right. Well, for the first song, it should be relatively simple. We have five songs that I liked out of 12, so probably I liked the first song is five out of 12. I could have played any of those five songs. Then I'm going to multiply that with the probability that I like the second song, given I like the first one. Well, the reason that this given part is going to be very important for us is because once one song is played, it is now out of the queue. Think about realistically when you play a CD. When you play a song, it's not going to be replayed until the entire CD goes through. So then, we have here that if one song was already played, then there's only 11 songs remaining. So the total sample space is now 11. And of those 11 songs, I only like four of them. I don't like five because one of the songs I liked was already played. So that means there's only four more songs I like, and also there's only 11 songs total. So then we have our probability, five times four is 20, 12 times 11 is 132. So we have our probability of 20 out of 132. So that's A, 20 out of 132. So that's an instance where the given probability was really important here, where that did influence the probability of the second situation. Now, B takes a little bit more work because it says probability that you like at least one. Well, that could happen by you like the first song and not the second, or you like the second song but not the first, or you like both of them. Notice that I'm combining all those phrases with the word or. That means you could find each of those probabilities and then add those probabilities together, because that's what or means, at least in probability. Instead, what we could do is find the probability of at least one by doing, I'll say, at least one is A-L-O. So probability of at least one is just one minus the probability of none of them. So that means in this situation, 1 minus the probability that I like neither. So I like none of the songs. Or 1 minus the probability that I, I'll say, don't like. So I'll say, dislike the first song times the probability that I dislike the second song given that I disliked the first song. I'm using DL for dislike, so I'll write that up here. Uh, DL is dislike. Well, the probability I don't like the first song, if there's five songs I like, so there's five that I like, of the 12, then that means of the 12, there's seven that I dislike. That again being a compliment, just doing one minus five out of 12 or just doing 12 minus five to get seven. So there's seven songs that I don't like out of 12. And then if I didn't like that first song, the uh, probably I don't like the second song is 
out of 11, because there's only 11 songs remaining, and of those, six of them I dislike. By the order of operations, we will multiply this first. So 7 times 6, um, that gives me 42 out of 132. And if I subtract these two, 132 out of 132 minus 42 out of 132, I will get an answer of 90 out of 132. And that's my answer for the probability of at least one. So that takes a little bit more work, and I'm showing every single individual step. The more you do this, the more you'll be able to go through this a little bit faster. But hopefully this kind of outlines everything that I'm doing here. Notice as well, yet again, I am not simplifying these fractions. And that makes comparing these two together... Whoop, didn't have my highlighter. That makes comparing these two together, so 20 out of 132 compared to 90 out of 132, it's a lot easier to compare the sizes of those. So it's always in my best interest not to uh, simplify if I don't have to. Um, none of our situations in this case restricted how they wanted the probability, but do keep in mind that some questions will ask you to write the probability as a decimal, some will ask it as a fraction, some will ask it as a percentage. So just keep in mind uh, which version they want. But for now, I think that should give you a good amount of examples of how probability works. Some of the ones you find will be a lot simpler to them than this. Some will be at this difficulty. Um, but uh, I hope that this helps you moving forward. In the next couple of videos, we're going to be talking about how to more focus on conditional probability, which was this given part that we've been working with here. Um, this given L1 or this given DL1. Um, we're going to be more focusing on how to find that in specific probability. And also, we're going to go through how to do expected value. I'm going to separate those into two different videos. Uh, with that said, I hope this helps. Uh, go ahead and try the homework up to uh, the point that you start to see conditional